Good morning, everybody. I am very excited to have a special episode of Solidarity Live today, which is what are we calling it, Richard? Solidarity Hour? Solidarity Combination. Hour. <laughs> I'm here with Richard Escow, host of The Zero Hour and one of my favorite media barons. Uh, and we're going to be combining our two shows this morning to talk to you about where to start. What a week. What a week in history. What a week before the election. Hi, Richard. How are you? Hi, Jocelyn. And of course, everybody knows that I'm speaking with my dear friend. I'm delighted to see her again, Jocelyn McCurdy Keats. So hi, Jocelyn. Hi. So uh, did you hear that the president got coronavirus this morning? Apparently, that was no, the news I woke up this out. morning. <laughs> that can't be true. <laughs> but he's been so careful. I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, we wish the president and, and, and the first lady the best, a speedy recovery, as we do to everyone who's suffered from this disease, including the many thousands who have suffered needlessly from this disease because of mismanagement and dishonesty at the uppermost levels of government, right? Absolutely. I mean, legitimately, I, it's, it's a bizarre thing, right? Because you don't, you don't want to victim shame people who get COVID because the reality is right. tons of people have been incredibly careful and still, still get infected. But it is a little surreal when you see the guy who is just mocking his political opponent for not wearing a mask to, you know, get it a couple of days afterwards. Yeah, and obviously the president of the United States is a different case, but, you know, I, I have a very honestly empathetic reaction even to people who are MAGA types mm -hmm. who get this disease. Uh, they've been misled, they've been de deceived, uh, they don't have the proper facts, and uh, being ignorant or even belligerent, it, it shouldn't be you know, a, a speedy recovery. Of course, as you and I are talking, Jocelyn, 207,000 people in this country have not recovered, have died. Um, it's incredible to think about the fact that 3,000 people died on, and I'm not the first, obviously, to make this, but 3,000 people die on 9-11, and we change our, war, our way of life forever. 207,000 people die, and there are a lot of people who still won't even put on a mask and there's still political leaders who tell them they don't have to put on a mask. It's just unbelievable. It's, so. it's a very bizarre time to be alive because Alex and I discuss this a lot. The really great news here is if you take certain precautions, if you wear a mask, if you pick your quarantine carefully, you're probably okay. You think we would be rejoicing in that information instead of resisting it. Like, isn't that, isn't that great news? All you got to do is put on this mask, make it a bit of a fashion statement, and you're probably fine. Why? <laughs> what is the resistance to that? I don't get it. Well, you know, obviously it goes into, actually, it's a really interesting question, Jocelyn, because I, uh, to me, the um, it goes back, and people make fun, of, and I get it, people on our side of the political spectrum make fun of uh, pe people because they say I'll do anything to you know protect this country and then when someone says well gee put this piece of cloth on your face they say no way so you know and I get it it seems like a contradiction to people but this country's culture going back to the before the founding of the United States has been you know nobody tells me what to do I mean it's mm -hmm. kind of, it's in a way it's silly it's like you're not the boss of me it's you know, our, our founding creed, but there's a lot to that. And it, it ties into our feelings about, as a country, about guns and, you know, individual liberties and all that. So uh, people aren't thinking about mutuality or protecting one another or our community. They're thinking, you know, this gov dictatorial government is not going to tell me to wear a mask. And in this case, sometimes it's just silly, but in this case, it's tragic because a lot of people, yeah. including people who follow that, like Herman Cain, aren't surviving. And, right. uh, you know, it, it points out a deep seated problem in our culture, I think. I think you're right. And I, you know, all right, Richard, this is going on our to do list of social problems to solve. OK, because, right. <laughs> you know. I mean, uh, this is, it's not, unfortunately, a lot of these political problems are reinforced by cultural problems. And this 
toxic individualism where we are resistant to even the most basic social norms that would do so much for each other. I I'm with you. I do not enjoy seeing MAGA types fall dead. Like there's this trend on the internet right. of, you know, Oh, he didn't want to mar- wear a mask. Now he's dead. Like, okay. I don't think you should die for that. Right. Right. I think it's less than advisable that you feel that way, but I certainly don't wish death upon my political enemies in that case. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, we're, we're, you know, it, it's interesting that this conversation is going this way, Jocelyn, but it's amazing how many people on our side do get into that. Uh, and, and what, and I go back to, you know, the prominent Democratic pundit and blogger who shall remain nameless, but uh, uh, who wrote when minors were losing their black lung benefits, uh, about to lose them, wrote, well, it serves them right for voting for Trump. And I just thought, you know, there, if you know anything about what black lung does to you and how it kills you, it's, it's the most horrible thing in the world to wish that on people. I would like our side, broadly speaking, right? Liberals, Democrats, leftists, and socialists, everybody kind of on our half. I would like all of us to be thinking more in terms of, and I've had this argument with congressmen and women and everybody else, to be thinking more in terms of our personal responsibility to persuade. You know, those people feel that way because we failed to make our case. So we got to do better. That's why I'm so supportive of people in states like West Virginia, you know, uh, Stephen Smith running for governor or Mm -hmm. Kathy Kunkel running for Congress and elsewhere around the country. We've got to do a better job going to those places and saying, you know, this is why we need to work together rather than just pointing the finger. Well, what did, you know, what did you, you know, the third person you, what did you do to help those people? And how can you think that just because they don't agree with you politically, maybe haven't even heard your point of view, uh, that they deserve to die? It's just a horrible way to think. It's tribalism. It's the very thing that they're condemning and rightfully on the other side, they're reflecting themselves which a kind of tribalism. Well, and it's really interesting you say this because I, this is the tension, the political tension we're facing right now on the left. If it, it, terrifies me that anyone would say that anyone deserves to die of black lung like that's disgusting to me when you said that I was like ugh, visceral reaction if our case is that we are the party of empathy and we're the party of human rights that means we have to be holding ourselves to a higher moral standard and it doesn't mean we can't play hardball politically but it does mean that we're not supposed to engage in a type of like sinister classism that results in not making any kind of attempt to see where people are coming from because not all people on the other side are created equal, you know, some people. Yeah, they're people, right? I mean, you know, I had this argument with my mother many years ago, you know, who was (laughs) like the world's greatest leftist activist, which is really interesting because before my parents divorced, she was like the wife of like a, you know, prominent local official. And she always looked like super waspy and preppy and, you know, had the pearls and the brooch or whatever. It's cameo brooch. (laughs) But she was like a hardcore socialist lefty. And so she became an activist. But we had this argument because she said, I'm tolerant of everything except intolerance. And I said, well, you should be tolerant of intolerance also because unless it's outright fascism or racism or whatever if people just don't understand how the world works and what Mm -hmm. humanity is rather than hating them we should try to reach out to them and see their humanity that's the martin luther king understood that gandhi understood that you know a lot of people understood that but she was like nope It's like she couldn't stand the sound of the German language because she remembered World War II. It was like, there were a lot of nice Germans, you know, like Goethe was a pretty good writer, right? I mean, like there's some, you know, so we all have our things, but that tribalism on our side is a, is a, is a big problem. Well, and it's, it's striking to me, the lack of complexity, because it's not, it's not terribly nuanced to say there are people who are racist 
And there are people who don't know any better. Like those are two different right. groups of people and they're not even that difficult to just dis- distinguish from each other. I mean, I'm, I went to high school in Southern Virginia and there are a lot of people. It's been a really exciting thing actually to watch a lot of that area radicalize and become more progressive as people who maybe were raised Republican or maybe just were socialized in a Southern Baptist environment start to read the news differently and be like, Hey, you know, why is black lives matter a controversial statement? It shouldn't be. And it's been very exciting to watch that evolution happen where I'm from and in many parts of the country. And we need to be open to that on the left. We need to be persuading. We need to be charismatic. I I find it very strange, especially from privileged white people, this idea that it's not our, it's not our job to be persuasive. Like, yes, it is. <laughs> That's what political organizing is. It is our job to be persuasive. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's like these privileged people who say it's not my job to educate them. And I say, oh, but it is your job to judge them, <laughs> right? So you like, you have it in the loft. No, thank you for that. Because it's, uh, the, and that was my main, I actually wrote about that blogger who made the West Virginia comment because you know, and basically uh, the summary of it is, you know what, if you don't want to bring people around to your point of view, if you don't want to talk to people who disagree with you, and maybe convince a few of them to agree with you, then you know what field you shouldn't be in? Politics. Thank you! Someone said it. Seriously, someone said it. (laughs) I had it somewhere there's (laughs) and, and it, you know, we thought we, we were done with the interview, but uh, the person kept the uh, recorder rolling with a very like, well-known member of Congress who was in 2010 saying, uh, well, these young people, they just don't want to vote Democratic. And I, I actually, you know, I, said, I beg you to change your attitude mm-hmm. because that comes across, whether it's young people, whether it's people of color, whether it's poor whites, whatever it is, if you look down on them for not already supporting you, then you're not going to get them, number one. And number two, you should understand that if you're a politician, you that's a sales job. You don't get to say, ah, oh, you know, my customers are stupid. You you have to go out there. If you didn't make the sale. If you lost the election, you know, you didn't make the sale. It's not Oh my goodness. Pay. My heart. Richard, you are so <laughs> right. I am loving this is starting to feel more like therapy than a show. Uh yeah, exactly. That's how and I deal with this all the time. Exactly. We have this toxic trend of shaming voters. Of sh- okay, so here's a fun anecdote. So I was, um, I, I was a waitress in my early 20s. And part of that, the financial insecurity is like I was switching addresses a lot. Do you know how difficult it was to register to vote? And how many elections I missed for logistical reasons? Because it was like unclear where I was registered right. and it was unclear oh. how to get a ballot. And we love to shame non-voters. Like I have literally had elections I didn't vote in because I didn't have ID, you know, it's in right. people don't realize how easy that is. So for now, you know, I'm in a situation where I have a lease, I have an apartment. It's very easy for me to register to vote and get my ballot simple. That was not always the case. If you have roommates, if you're switching houses a lot, if you're housing insecure, if you're financially insecure, there are so many things that can make the basic act of voting very inaccessible. And the lack of empathy for that is shocking to me. Shouldn't yeah, and, we as progressives be like trying to make sure that doesn't happen? And if you're, oh, don't even get me started on that. But you know, <laughs> if you're a single mom, even in a normal year, if you're a single mom living in East St. Louis working at a fast food restaurant where they change your shift every day, they call you on Tuesday yes. night and say, okay, you're working the, the evening shift on Wednesday and they call you Wednesday night and they say, okay, you're working the morning shift tomorrow. If you're that person, and by the way, you now have to take a bus and change three times and it takes you two hours to get to your polling place, you better give that single mother a damn good reason to do all that and maybe miss a day of work when she can't afford to lose the money. You better give her a, a, a really good reason to come out and spend a day oh, and then wait in line maybe for six hours, given uh to vote for you 
uh, you better not judge her if you don't if she doesn't if she say oh that's the same old bs i've been hearing for 30 years then you got to figure out how to get through to her it's not her job she has a job she works at the restaurant it's your job if you're in politics it's your job if you're an activist or advocate like you and me jocelyn so you better be prepared to figure out how to reach her and everybody like her, how to get her a ride to the polls, how to, you know, whatever it takes, how to make sure she's registered. There are a couple of good groups doing that, but any, you know, the Democratic Party should be investing in this big time and it's not, and it never has, and it hasn't fought back enough when the Republicans make it even harder for black people to vote, which is so outrageous. They just like, oh, that, they really shouldn't do that. You know, it's like, there was an old Marx Brothers movie where like a gangster comes in and kidnaps Groucho and ties him up and says he's going to kill him. And Groucho says, there'll be a letter about this in the Times tomorrow morning. I mean, that's the, that's what the Democratic Party does instead of saying, you know what, we're in a full out nonviolent war for democracy and they don't do it and they don't fight full out to persuade that single mom, which means raising the minimum wage, which means family and sick leave, they, they don't do it. And then they complain about voters when they don't, 48% of the electorate didn't even vote. Well, that's your fault. Amen. A hundred percent. Amen. And it's, it's getting worse. It's getting worse with mail-in voting. It's getting worse with what we've seen in states like Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, where things are getting even more dramatically difficult and I don't know why our, but I mean, it's endemic of the cultural problem we have where when there are class problems, we blame the people who are suffering in the structural situation instead of make the structures better. Like voting is going to be even more difficult this time around. And I think there are a lot of people who are organizing around that, but not nearly enough. And we're still putting the onus on individuals to make sure that they know how to do it, but it's tremendously complicated. And a lot of people are legitimately concerned that if they go to the polls, it's unsafe. They're concerned if they do a mail-in ballot, it won't be counted. Right. And I, I can't blame people for that level of anxiety. You know, absolutely. And, and um, I, uh, then of course, there's this whole threat factor from Trump and his minions and the so-called Proud Boys and these various... I've always been one to say, you know, Democrats go over the top about this stuff. Rachel Maddow exaggerates uh, Russiagate and all that. But, and there have always been totalitarian elements in the U.S. government. You know, the spy mass espionage that Snowden revealed happened under Obama as well as Bush. But, which all of which is true, and I retract none of it. But the fact is that situation is getting worse. We made plans to talk about fascism today with a, a, a guest who couldn't make it, but you know, I'm like the guy who's saying, let's keep a level head about, you know, not yelling fire over fascism. Well, fire, you know, it's getting to be a, a legitimate concern on top of all of this. And that's not like the average Trump voter. It's not the average non-voter in, you know, Mississippi. It's a hardcore minority of yes. the public, but they're yes. capable of doing enormous damage, destabilizing democracy. It's always a small percentage that undermines the whole system. And it's not like we have democracy now. We have a, at best an imperfect democracy, but they could undermine you know, even the small amount that we've got. So uh, I'm definitely... Uh, worried about that and worried about we don't know how last thing and then I'll stop ranting uh, I, I was talking with some friends the other day one of them great guy you know him uh, really like him really smart but you know he's oh it's just a few weeks ago he, he a democratic consultant and he said all the uh, how did he put all the fundamentals are in our favor meaning the democrats favor mm -hmm. for November 3rd and I just like, what fundamentals? You mean all the fundamentals of how elections go during a pandemic when you have a totalitarian right. president and civil violence and people shooting each other in the streets 
Plus, you ha everybody has to do it mail-in, and they're deliberately already challenging the legitimacy of the outcome. You mean those fundamentals? Because I don't think we know what they are. So end of rant is even now with Trump sick and Trump blowing it at the debate, which I think he did, um, I don't take anything for granted. I think that is really intelligent. And I think that we need to, God, I can't get over what you just said. I mean, we, if you want to, this is a sales job. This is a sales job for our democracy. And we as Democrats need to show up every day, one day at a time and not take anything for granted, not get lost in chutzpah or being condescending or anything which is going to result in alienating the people that we need, whether it's our own base which it's been shocking to me, the extent to which we've decided to alienate our own base over the past year <laughs> or people yeah, no, who are just unpersuadable or uninvested. And, but you know, the thing about the pandemic, like, does it strike you as crazy that we now have a president and a first lady and whatever hope Hicks is uh, positive <laughs> for coronavirus <laughs> And still no meaningful coronavirus relief package. That's shocking, right? Yeah. Well, it is and it isn't. Because remember, all these people, and if Trump pretends to be different than other Republicans, he's not that different except for the like open hate. I like to say Trump is the id of the, you know, American. Elite. Yes. But, but he, uh, they hate the federal government. And they basically want it to go away. And that's like kind of a spectrum of people that ranges from Mitch McConnell to like the Bundys, right? I mean, they just hate the federal government. And so like to address this effectively, the federal government has to step in and be decisive. And their attitude, I think literally, if they had to put it this way, is I'd rather die. I'd rather yes. die than have a strong federal government. Trump, I think his attitude, you know, I don't... He's, he's like, you know, some feral creature or something. It, it's hard to plug into his brain, but he definitely doesn't want to put in the work. I think that's one Democratic accusation, 100% true. I think he's just a lazy. But I also think um, he uh, doesn't, you know, he's picked people who don't you know, want to take decisive action. He doesn't think the government should take decisive action. I don't think this will change his mind. Boris Johnson is the closest thing to Trump on the world stage. He, he was really sick. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he didn't, I don't think he got that much better afterwards. And Great Britain's rate is the closest to ours of any developed country. So, uh, you know, we're up against this is really it's like a flash of light yes all the light and dark parts of our culture and our politics and our economy and i just hope we'll take advantage of this you know moment of insight trump won't but i i, I hope the rest of us will i'm not encouraged i mean i don't think the democratic party has come out and said everybody needs two thousand dollars so this is over or or uh you know some of the other things they could be doing everybody you know, Medicare for everyone until the crisis has passed, you know, instead there's a terrible proposal to just extend pay for people's COBRA coverage if they lost their job. Well, what about all the people who didn't have jobs, you know, and co even with COBRA to go to see the doctor is hospital, much less go to the, is expensive. Excuse well, me. have you, have much you had go to, to take, hospital. go to the doctor since COVID because it's complicated. It's really difficult. And full disclosure, I have insurance and it's still, it's not easy. And there are startling and staggering numbers of rates of coronavirus in homeless communities. Right. No and kidding. Lower income communities, people of color are struggling way worse than anyone else. And it's like, okay, you know, is there, <laughs> is there any self-awareness about the fact that we have this chasm that's happening in this community uh, well, community in America, where you have upper middle class people, it's not that they're not affected, but it's, it's buffered by the class structures. And then you have people who don't have insurance, who are in essential worker jobs, and are really struggling to get basic care when they are the people who are more likely to be infected. It's terrifying. No, it's completely terrifying. Uh, so I'll t I haven't 
told this story yet, but I, I was really sick for two, three months, it's starting in about eh, March of this year. And we didn't know what it was. It was like, you know, I have asthma and stuff. So, and I have this blood disorder where, you know, I'm, I got to be careful. And I got really sick and I, I couldn't breathe. And, you know, I was coughing. I didn't have a fever, so it didn't fit the COVID pattern. But, you know, I could barely walk to the refrigerator. I was a mess. And uh, I needed a pulmonologist and I couldn't get one. For oh, like no. Weeks. And, um, and I tried everything. And, you know, I mean, I know how to work the system. I used to work for insurance companies. I couldn't get anybody. And finally, like the husband of uh, a woman I went to high school with, she's a doctor. Her husband is a pulmonologist. He talked to me on the phone. He was, you know, in New York, I'm in DC, but, uh, and he basically said, you know, he talked about what to do and what it probably was and, and, but he couldn't prescribe for me. And uh, then I said, and as far as this new disease is going, I guess I shouldn't. He said, don't. And I said, what you mean? Don't get the, uh, the coronavirus. He said, don't even finish your sentence about the coronavirus. You'd be a dead duck until this thing is under control. And it was another two weeks before I could even see anybody. <sighs> and finally, you know, now I'm like taking all these in expensive like maintenance injections and stuff and it took care of it. But it was, if I had all that trouble uh, getting to work the system, imagine if somebody, even if they have insurance, but they're working two jobs to make ends meet. And they're, you know what I mean? I, I, I could take, you know, the time, um, don't tell Alex Lawson, I could take the time to make all the calls. He, uh, he, he could, uh, you know, that, that hypothetical person, he or she wouldn't be able to do that. Right. So that's the system we work in right now. And that's, you know, the fact that, and then what if they, went and they had coronavirus and they wound up on a ventilator and they get that bill for fifteen thousand dollars what then because that's what quote unquote good health insurance does for you in this country well and we've discussed that on here too the remdesivir price gouging all of the price gouging for even if you are even if you are insured even if you have covid you go in even the things that we're able to do for people are just exorbitantly almost illegally expensive or should be illegally expensive, but aren't. And it's just like, you must have been so scared. I would have been terrified. It was nerve wracking. It was totally nerve wracking. My wife was terrified. My kids were terrified. And it was just so frustrating. Finally, I got a prescription for this expensive medication I need, but it has to be administered in a special clinic or center. So they send the authorization over to the center and I don't hear anything for two weeks and I'm calling them and they're not calling me, but that's how our system works. Why didn't I hear anything? Because it's a for-profit clinic. Right. And they laid off 80% of their staff. Right. As soon as coronavirus comes, finally they call and say, oh, we're sorry. It was sitting in the fax machine. It's like, it really? Because I could have died. And you know, the thing was in the fax machine, but that's how our system works because it's insane because I don't get just to walk the prescription. Oh, then they had to do pre-certification from the insurance company and the insurance company was balking. You know, people are dying because of this stupidity and this bureaucracy. And people say the government's a bureaucracy. Try Blue Cross. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you bring up a really interesting point. We have all these right-wing personalities who dislike the government and argument that it's inefficient. Okay. Corporate private insurance is not efficient. I have had like tremendous trouble just getting basic things done and accomplished with my healthcare plan <laughs> because you are, you're calling four different people. You need to figure out if this is covered, if that is covered. And it's just, it's not efficient. It's tremendously expensive. The reason we still have it is because it makes a very small group of people, a very large amount of money. And that's it. Yeah, my, my favorite story about that, and bear in mind, like I say, I worked for insurance companies for many years and I used to do the, you know, of the underwriting and the financial stuff. I was really good at it. I mean, I kind of intellectually liked it, but anyway, 
uh, cause I wasn't, you know, the moral implications hadn't sunk in yet. So I, um, a couple years ago, I needed like super minor surgery, right? I mean, like hernia repair, you know, I had to get in and out in the morning, one morning, but just as an experiment. So I went to my, uh, I had Sigma then I went to the website and it said, ask your doctor how much it's going to cost. Uh, you know, here are some tips. Uh, ask if there are any lower cost alternatives. Like, yeah, I need brain surgery. I'm going to say, hey, is there a cheap way to do this stuff? But uh, so I decided to play their game, right? So uh, I said to the doctor, it was like, you know, super arrogant surgeon type, it's perfect silver hair and, you know, expensive suits and everything. So, so by the way, doc, how much is this going to cost? And he says, I have no idea. You can talk to my business office. I said, okay, I'll do that. I talked to the business office. I went to the business person and I said, so how much is this going to cost? And she said, um, well, we, we really don't know. We're part of the hospital system and the hospital will determine that. So why don't you call the Johns Hopkins business office? Uh, here's the number. So I called the John, and bear in mind, I put some time into it by this point. I called the Johns Hopkins business number and I say, oh, well, I'm scheduled for surgery on the 23rd. Uh, how much is it going to cost? And you know what they said to me? Ask your doctor. What? I went in a perfect circle, never found out, did the surgery, got a bill afterwards for $3,200. And that's with quote unquote, good insurance. Oh my bucks. goodness. Yeah. That's insane, Richard. It's totally insane, but that's our system. All right. How do we fix it? One, Medicare for all. Right. Wait, no, sorry. First, coronavirus relief package, then Which Medicare for all. Medicare for, for all. I mean, to me, it's like give people health care. We are killing each other by transmitting this disease. You can do everything right quote unquote, for the coronavirus. You can wear your mask, you can wash your hands, you can keep your distance. You can still get it. People still get it because, you know, it just takes a single slip or whatever. So number one, get people health care, period, for the duration of the virus. The, uh, and the, you know, this COBRA thing is ridiculous. You can't, a lot of people don't get care that they need. I think maybe I have a flu, but I, I can't afford the 40 buck doctor copay and the a hundred buck medication copay. Get rid of all of that. So everybody gets the care they need for the duration of the coronavirus. Then afterwards, when people see how well that works, say, well, you know, we're glad the pandemic's over. Didn't you like that? Don't you want to keep that? Wasn't yeah. that like a good idea? That that's my Escal grand plan for health. I love that. That's a great plan. <laughs> well, and in in terms of the economic implications, I mean, the lack the one twelve hundred dollar stimulus check as shocking. I mean, I perhaps optimistically thought that the Heroes Act was going to pass and we were going to have a second round of stimulus checks. Do you think that's off the table? The like, what are your projections for that? I kind of economic relief for all the people. I who've been think it's, I think even look, the, the heroes act is inadequate in a lot of ways. I just, this, the, the Cobra plan, which I think is stupid. And by the way, is unequal because right. it, it gives people who had jobs coverage and not people who didn't. And because it helps the insurance company, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot about the heroes act. I don't like, but the heroes act also gives what $2 trillion to state governments that they desperately need. So the heroes act has a lot of things in it. We need um, some money for people and people need money. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm not optimistic. Something will pass. I mean, I think that, the McConnell's strategy is to offer something for businesses and then say, well, the Democrats don't want to agree to it. And then, you know, uh, an argument that's hard to refute, even if it's deceptive, which is they're going to say, well, let's at least do what we agree on. Mm -hmm. And, the, you know, the Democrats are saying, you know, Pelosi and the others are saying, and I get what they're doing. They're saying, well, no, let's not just give stuff to people you like. Let's hold off and give things to everybody. But I, I it, you know, it's obviously just all 
betting at this point, but I would bet against there being something be- passed before the election. Unless- I, oh, I would, I would a hundred percent agree with that. And it's, it's really a shame because between the Supreme court nomination and the election and everything that's going on, we were really missing the congressional incompetence that has happened this year. We have managed to find the time and funds to funnel money back into the corporate class to a degree where people's investments have largely been protected, but there's been almost nothing done for working in middle-class Americans. And one of the biggest economic blows we've had in this century, it's insane. I'm still reeling from that level of just complete political inaction. Well, it's, it's not, yeah, I get what you're saying. It's not political action, inaction. It's political action for the big corporations and the well, Wall that's Street true, yeah, and Wall Street, and it's all as you know any smart observer it was designed to benefit big corporations that are publicly traded over smaller businesses. Some some smaller businesses are failing while big corporations are are thriving and like mm-hmm. you know the Michelin Man balloon to kind of float <laughs> over us like with that and. <laughs> good analogy (laughs) yeah and uh but everybody else is struggling and they don't care and they'll never care i mean it's just so capitalist system is going down i love rick uh, rick wolf and i greatly admire him i'm not sure that's true it shows enormous resiliency but the dystopian scenario is and this has been written about and talked about a lot on the right and among libertarians and in the Silicon Valley, it's like 85% of the people are basically just excess weight and you give them just enough money to not starve to death and you keep them, uh, what was John Lennon's line, doped on religion and sex and TV, except now it's doped on uh, internet click. And um, and that's their what they're planning for. And this is why like, uh, you know, the UBI, when the universal basic income comes up, there are different ways to do it. But why, the reason why the Silicon Valley wants and Andrew Yang want to give everybody a thousand dollars, which isn't that much when you think of it, is they want to warehouse 85 percent of the population. And mm-hmm. um, that's the night that no protection from disease. Um, you know, this is uh, that's one scenario. Wolf thinks the system and he's a really smart guy, thinks the system is going to collapse and we need to be prepared to manage the change and the one thing i'm sure of is we need to get ready and manage the change that's why i think we should still keep proposing bold and idealistic visions of what the society can be because there's going to come a time if it's not here already that we it's either going to get better or it's going to get a lot worse and we better like try to stack the deck in favor of improvement and not you know uh dystopia so well, I'm I'm all in favor of the better vision, personally. <laughs> really, I kind of saw you as a dystopian. Type. Okay. Yes, let's like just that. like destroy everything. Why not? Could be fun. <laughs> Burn it. Oh, there are those people, you know. There are. There was a study I've written about it a couple of times. I'll write about it again. There was a political science study done, published in 2018, showing the way the scientists, the researchers, put it is their conclusion was that roughly 40% of the electorate marked down the democratic cosmos. They wanted to, that they spread what? false stories and fake news and so on, not because they believed it, but because they hate the elites and they want to stick it to the elites. It makes a lot of sense to me. Of course, what they didn't say, but I say is, can you can you blame them? I yeah. Mean, they've been screw, screwed over for generations, for decades. And yeah, they want to get ba- back at somebody. They want to get back at the people who did this to them. We haven't gone, Bernie, you know, tried, a couple other people are trying, but we haven't gone out there and explained to them what's going wrong. So yeah, they want to throw, I remember a friend of mine said when Trump was elected, oh, this is a brick through the window of the establishment. I said more like a hand grenade but yes you know i get it i get the frustration i get the dis disaffection and there's a side of me that when i first read that phrase burn down the the political cosmos i was like yeah that kind of sounds good and i don't really feel that way but i get the anger and we got to start speaking to that 
And I have no idea how I got off on this tangent, but I just, I just end it by saying, you know, you know, Jocelyn, that I worked for Bernie. I was one of his first hires in 2015 for the campaign. And, you know, when I talk about respecting like conservatives or, you know, white rural Trump voters or whatever, it's not from a place of like, oh, let's be a moderate and try yes. to seize them. I used to watch Bernie with those people and, you know, the most far left guy in mainstream politics. And uh, he was always totally respectful and treated those people like equals and aunt, which with Bernie sometimes means he would yell at them because that's what he does with people. But but he would be respectful and he would listen and he, he didn't have that, you know, looking down his nose attitude. He, uh, he talked to them. I mean, that's how you get elected. Vermont, people think it's some liberal hippie state, which it is in a few places. It's a rural gun toting, you know, uh, country folk state. But he won enough of those people over by being real and by listening in town halls and stuff. And I think we need to be doing a lot more of that. I'm not, I don't think it's the only thing we need to be doing, but uh, I think we ought to be going out there and saying, you know, your, your family farm's gone bankrupt after six generations. That sucks. What can we do about it? Everybody in your, you know, half the people you know in your town are addicted to opioids. By the way, I've lost a close family member to opioid addiction, so I don't take it lightly at all, very young too, but um, we need to start, it's personal with me, so we need to start addressing these issues respectfully and honestly and saying we're going to do something about it that makes a difference. I mean, in, the, in Tennessee, rural Tennessee, they loved the Democratic Party and FDR for what, 50 years because of the Tennessee Valley Authority. You know, you lay some rails, provide some jobs, build some housing, uh, you know, uh, get people above subsistence existence, they'll know and they'll appreciate it. I think that's absolutely correct. Um, yeah, so we're going to have to close out a little early. We're having some Wi-Fi issues. Oh, really? <laughs> messing up our stream, but I just want to- What's happening? I'm curious. I let our audience. Is it me? No, it's not. It's not you, Brad. Right. <laughs> I see. See, this is classic me, by the way. Now you've had another insight to my personality. It's not you. It's me. The uh, <laughs> what did I do something wrong? Is no, it's my... not you. It's not you. <laughs> Wasn't trying to call Brad out like that. But hey, why not? <laughs> Uh, so yes, we have to wind down a couple minutes early, but this has been a wonderful 50 minutes of the solidarity hour. Richard, do you have any closing thoughts? Just that it's wonderful to see you, Jocelyn. And I'm so glad that I was asked to step in and do this. I've really enjoyed it. So thanks. No, thank you so much. I, we should do this again, actually. I've really enjoyed it. Anytime. <laughs> Thank you so much, you guys, for being with us. And please, you know, like as we were discussing, make sure you're registered to vote. And when you help other people register to vote, please be nice because you do not know what barriers they're dealing with. Have a great weekend and we'll see you next week.